And now, Tara Westover, author of Educated, a memoir. Here with Matt Thompson, The Atlantic's executive editor. Soft. <laughs> It is a real pleasure to get to have this conversation. This book that you wrote, this memoir, Educated, um, traveled around the Atlantic newsroom like a fever through a preschool. We were all just <laughs> talking with one another. Have you read this book yet? Um, I did, yeah. It's worth it. <laughs> For the benefit of anyone in our audience who hasn't read it, I'll say the book is about your upbringing first in a remote setting on a mountain peak, Bucks Peak, Idaho, um, where your parents kept you out of school and mostly out of view of the government um, while you were being raised and echoed some ideas from things like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion to you as you were being raised. And you had to contend with the physically abusive older brother and then um, you left. You left Bucks Peak, you went to Brigham Young University, you graduated magna cum laude, if that's if I'm correct about that. Is it weird I can't remember? It's not weird, it's not weird. It was one of those ago. ones, not the fancy one, not the next some, level. Yeah, yeah. I'm <laughs> one with down. Magna. Uh, <laughs> and then you studied at Harvard, you earned a history PhD at Cambridge. Um, you now teach and study history. Um, so, one of the themes in the book is dueling realities um, about there are several moments in the book where you come to confront a reality that's different from the one that you were raised in um, and you at some point you have to kind of make a choice about which reality you're going to live in. I wanted to ask you about actually last week's Senate testimony from Brett Kavanaugh and Christine Blasey Ford. Um, it was striking to see this hearing where there are these two realities, two very starkly divergent realities on display. Two individuals 100% correct or 100% sure that they lived through the same history and yet telling two very different stories. What have you taken away from your experience about bridging that chasm of reality? So you're starting with a small, easy question. Yeah. <laughs> Softball, right off the bat. Thanks, man. No uh, problem. I mean, that's a huge thing. I can't solve that for anyone, but I can nibble at the edges of that. I think sometimes when we demand 100% certainty from people, I think it can almost be a, a self-defensive position. People have to be 100% sure because they know right out, right out of the gate they're not going to be believed and their perspective is going to be uh, assaulted and their character is going to be assaulted. And so, in a way, I think we, we put a completely irrational standard. Mm. We hold that up and we make people meet it, even though everything we know about trauma, everything we know about um, what the brain is like with the recall, there are going to be strange details that people hold on to and strange details that they forget. And in a way, I think, not allowing people to have imperfect memories, but, but to still have their perspective have weight and meaning and value, I think is, is in part because we're not valuing those, those people. We're not allowing them to be fully complete people. So I think it seems to me that it would be irrational, I think, to expect her to remember everything that happened. Mm. But I'm guessing, I mean, if, if she, when she says I'm 100% sure it was him, when people try to say, oh, it was probably somebody else, I find that my guess is that she didn't confuse who it was. I mean, that's kind of unlikely, <laughs> <laughs> I think. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that I know she's right or wrong, but I'm just saying that's a, weird, that's a weird way to come at memory. I mean, we know things. We've been studying the human brain for a while. We know things about about psychology, and I think it's, it's really unfortunate that something like this has to be so completely politicized. But the thing is, this is a case where it's politicized because it's the Supreme Court, and yet it seems to me that it's always so politicized, and we always take people who are coming forward with these kind of memories and hold them to an extreme standard of what they ought to remember, even though everything we know psychologically is that is not how memory works. It's mm. not how it works. There's this, um, there's this word that's become more and more au courant, gaslighting. Um, and in one way, your story is like the ultimate 
<laughs> example of gaslighting. Um, and you're told that your interpretation of your own life, in some ways, is, um, is not correct or is illegitimate. Yeah. Do you think that that's a fair description of the, uh, what is it like to go through that experience? I wanted to write the book, I guess it's about gaslighting. I wanted to write not just about how memory is fallible, but how do we sort through the fact that memory is fallible? How do we give weight? Why do we give weight to some people's opinions over others? I think there's a part in the book that I think of as a real step forward for myself. Uh, I don't know if I can remember the exact line. It's just ironic, because I did write it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I say something like, I, um, I learned to trust my own mind and my own memory. Not because, not more than I, not because I thought it was absolute, uh, and I trusted my memory as much, but I trusted my memory as much as anybody else's, and, and more <laughs> than some people's. And I think it's sometimes the fact that memory is fallible is, is used to silence people, and it has nothing to do with the fact that memory is fallible. It seems like we say, well, some people's memories are fallible, and other people we trust. And that seems to me to have a lot more to do with power dynamics than with actual faults of memory. So I wanted to write a, the book, at least in part. I'm not a memory fundamentalist. I put footnotes in my book. I document places where my family remembers it differently, things I can't square with, with my journal entries or my brother's journal entries. I, I'm, I'm not a fundamentalist about what I remember. I think there's something uh, self-negating in mm. expecting yourself to be a perfect vault of information about your own in your own past. I, I tend to think accepting your weaknesses and your inability to remember perfectly is just part of self-acceptance. And expecting someone to have a perfect memory is holding them up to a standard that is, is probably part of what was dysfunctional about that situation in the first yeah. place. My guess is it's all connected. One of my favorite parts of the book, in fact, is a note on the text that comes at the very end where you talk about um, memoir and um, trying to construct your own interpretation of the past while leaving room for other interpretations of it. It's a, it's a fascinating moment in it. I was listening to an interview that you did with your thesis advisor, David Runciman, and you were talking about um, the way that um, some folks, particularly, you know, I come from an evangelical Christian milieu, and so I heard this, uh, heard a lot of this growing up. Um, other Christians describing Mormonism um, as a cult. And you said um, to, to Runciman, you said, you know, in many ways, Cambridge, <laughs> the Cambridge University is more of a cult um, than Mormonism is. W what did you mean by that? I thought I would get in a lot of trouble for that. Uh, <laughs> kind of wasn't checking Twitter for a couple days after that interview. Um, it depends on how you define a cult. I think my definition of a cult is any human community that, that you have ideological purity that is maintained by ostracizing people who don't maintain that standard of purity. And I never experienced that at BYU. I mm. think BYU had this amazing tradition of, uh, of trying to save your soul, that belief in a human soul, that every person is a child of God. And the funny thing about me defending this discourse is I'm not religious <laughs> anymore, but I, I found that a really valuable approach, and especially in a, val a valuable approach to arguing with people. Mm. I'm a little bit sympathetic to the arguments that have been made by Marilyn Robinson in her recent essays and speeches she's given where she talks about there's a, a risk in replacing the language of the soul and human dignity that we've had for the last couple thousand years with, with really nascent scientific understanding that is, you know, firing synapses and responses to stimuli. Because we know that that understanding of the brain will evolve. It will continue to mature. But while it's evolving, we have to ask ourselves, do we want to have a really simplistic conception of what human beings are? And how does that lead us to treat people when we disagree with them? When we, uh, what if it's about really important things? I'm, I arrived at Cambridge with some really shocking views. You know, I said some really shocking things at Cambridge. I'd been told horrible things, for example, about uh, I never met anyone who was gay, and I'd been told horrible things about people who were gay. And I repeated some of them. And I'm so grateful that there were people who just turned away from me and wouldn't talk to me. That happened. But there were several people who just dealt with me yeah. <laughs> and just said, you seem like a good person. Why are you saying any of this? Like, where is this coming from? 
And I argued with them, and I was belligerent, and I was obnoxious, and after one of these fights, I had this fight that went till you know, 3 o'clock in the morning, and I still have the email I wrote that person the next morning where I said all these terrible things, and then the next morning I wrote him and I said, hey, Andrew, it was really lovely to meet you last night. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to let you know I thought over what you said, and uh, you were right, and I was wrong, and hope to see you around. Um, and I think that was the last time I said anything publicly really homophobic. You know, good job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> good job. Good job indeed. Uh, but I think, I think that tendency to turn away. I, I have a friend in New York who said to me recently she felt like she had an obligation to never speak to anyone in her office who voted for Trump. Hmm. And I felt like, you've got it right, except for the never part. It should be always. <laughs> like, you should be always speaking to the people that you disagree with and not to shout at them. But, uh, but I, I think that, that idea of engaging and that people have value even when that value is not apparent to you. People, people have worth and they deserve to be treated a certain way. And I think even when they have bigoted views, I think treating someone with, with, with more generosity than they're treating whatever group they're being biased against is a way of showing people, look, this is what dialogue is like. This is what respect is like. Yeah. And for me, it's, it's the thing that would really start to change my mind about things I needed to change my mind about. You have, <laughs> since, uh, since your book appeared at the top of President Obama's summer reading list, I'm sure that you've spent plenty of time um, in milieus like this one, in rooms like this one. Um, what do you think is most misunderstood about the world you came from in a context like this? Um, in the context of the book or outside? I, that's interesting. I think, I think people always want to caricaturize people. And we, we take a really simplistic view of someone and we think, well, we know what that is. And we, our brains are kind of wired to operate in caricatures, actually. And it's something we have to really mm. resist. And I think my parents fit a certain stereotype really, really well, and there's a serious risk of them being reduced to that. I wanted to write a book that I wanted to counter that. I wanted, these are fully complicated human beings, you know, and I wanted to tell a story that where they were fully complicated human beings. Yeah. Um, what advice would you uh, bring to someone who is trying to navigate um, these, uh, trying to cross someone else's reality, even in just having that conversation in just trying to get someone else's perspective, um, how do you approach it? How do you do it? I think humility is the secret to most, most things. <laughs> and most things having to do with respect and education. I think if you are someone who was raised and you were given a good education and you were exposed to ideas and you were exposed to the world, I, I, just, I think education should never be a stick that you use to beat other people into submission. It should never be a source of arrogance. Mm -hmm. It should always be something that makes you want to learn more about a person and, and not just tell them more things. So I think education, as much as we can associate education with inquiry and, and not just with, with, with knowing, with already having all the answers, uh, but I, I really think it's, it's humility and, and, and trying, not to be, trying not to be so arrogant that we alienate people with our knowledge. But the, we just show people knowledge is actually really wonderful and exciting and it's discovery and it's, it's great. It's not a weapon. Yeah. It's an experience and we all should share it. Well, we have left the audience hopefully happily unspoiled for many of the actual stories in this very good memoir. So Tara Westover, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thanks to all of you.